Let's talk about velocity. There's a lot going on here, so let's jump right in. Before we can actually discuss velocity, or really talk about anything changing, we have to understand something about time. Time is one of those things that everybody thinks they know about, but when I ask them to define it, they usually have a very hard time doing so. One definition of time that I find particularly useful is attributed to either Albert Einstein or Buckaroo Banzai, depending on whom you believe. But that definition states that time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. If you think about it, if something has changed, then time had to have elapsed. You cannot be in two different positions at the same time. If you're changing your position from one point to the next, then time had to have elapsed in order for you to change that position. Time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once. So with that out of the way, let's talk about velocity. Velocity is how fast you are moving in a particular direction. So because we have that in a particular direction there, realize that when we're talking about velocity, we're talking about a vector. So we have two runners here. We have runner A up at the top and runner B down at the bottom. And let's just say they're going to run a 100 meter race. Now, if we're going to look at a 100 meter race, we can put our origin anywhere we want. But we want to put that origin either someplace that physically makes sense or that's mathematically convenient. And I think for, say, a 100 meter race, both of those conditions are satisfied if we put the origin at the start. And notice that we are going to have a position vector that goes from the start to the finish. And so our displacement is going to be that difference from our final position to our initial position, which in this case here would end up being 100 meters. Now, the gun goes off, our runners start, and ooh, we see that our runner below smoked the runner above. She was much faster than him which means that she had to have a greater velocity. But let's delve deeper into this whole concept of velocity. Velocity ends up being our change in position divided by our change in time. Now again, with this one line of code, we can determine a lot of different things. For example, we know that if we want to have a greater velocity, then we either have to have a smaller displacement for the same amount of time, or we have to have a smaller change in time for the same displacement. Once again, a larger velocity will occur if we have a larger displacement for the same amount of time, or if we have a smaller amount of time for the same displacement. We can also end up rearranging our variables like you see that I did here. And this shows us that our velocity multiplied by our change in time is going to be our displacement. And once again, we can see that we're going to have a greater displacement if we end up having a larger velocity for the same amount of time, or if we have a greater change in time for that same velocity. And this is probably a more appropriate way of viewing the world. Right, is that we have a change in our position because we have a velocity. We don't have a velocity because we have a change in position. Of course, we could also rearrange our equation like so. And this will tell us who actually arrived at a particular point more quickly. For example, in our 100 meter race, we see that for both runners, the displacement was 100 meters which goes up in the numerator. Now, remember, if we have a larger denominator, we are going to have a smaller variable over on the left-hand side of the equation. So the person with the greater velocity for the same displacement will arrive at their destination sooner. So now let's go ahead and take a look at describing these ideas with vectors. We have our two runners, runner A and runner B, and they're going to start at the same position. At a certain point in time, we see that runner B displaced greater than did runner A. 
So if we look at our process boxes here, we will see that runner B had to have had a greater velocity than did runner A. Now let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. Let's take a look at runner B. Our runner B starts at origin and ends up at another point at another instant in time. Now let's go ahead and let's take that and let's put that on a vertical axis and let's put time on our horizontal axis. Now right now you should look at this graph and you should call foul. Why should you call foul? Because at time zero we have body B at two different positions at the same instant in time. Remember, time is the thing that prevents everything from happening at once and you can't be in two different positions at the same point in time. So what we have to do is we have to adjust our graph and we have to put our position at time prime at a different point in time or t prime. Now we have an appropriate graph. Now body B, or in this case runner B, is in two different positions at two different points in time. Now let's go ahead and let's draw a line that goes from one position to the next position. Again, it cannot go straight up because you cannot be in two different positions at the same point in time. The slope of this line, of this position time curve, is going to end up being the velocity of runner B. Recall that the slope is going to be the change in Y divided by the change in X. Well, remember on Y we have, appropriately enough, our position, and on the X we have the time. So our change in position divided by our change in time, which is our equation for velocity, also shows up graphically that it ends up being the slope on that position time curve. So velocity is the slope of the position time curve. What that also means is that the displacement is the area under the velocity time curve. So if we were to look at velocity, and we were to look at time, and we were to look at the area under that curve, that area ends up being the displacement. And this is so important because throughout the entire course, we're going to be looking at slopes and we're going to be looking at areas under curves. And so it's important that you appreciate when you're looking at a graph what that slope represents and what that area under the curve represents. Now again, recall that we ended up manipulating our equation for velocity so that we had velocity times the change in time equals the change in position. Well, this is just the area of a rectangle, the base times the height. In this case, the height ends up being the velocity, and the base ends up being the change in time. I should also point out that this is only appropriate if velocity ends up being constant. If velocity isn't constant, then we're basically looking at the area under a triangle. And again, I'll explain a little bit more of this as the course progresses. I don't want you to get too intimidated by this right now, what I want you to understand is that, once again, that the displacement is the area under the velocity time curve. Now, let's return to our two runners once again, runner A and runner B. And we said at another instant in time, runner B had gone further than did runner A. And recall that I said in terms of a process box, that means that runner B had a greater velocity than did runner A. Well, let's go ahead and collapse them down onto the same graph. And then turn that graph upright so we can look at position versus time. And once again, you should be calling foul and saying that this is not an appropriate graph because now we have two different bodies that have two different positions at the same point in time. So again, we have to adjust those prime positions for where they are at T prime. It's perfectly legal for two bodies to be at the same position at a point in time, but a body cannot be in two different positions at the same point in time. 
Okay, and then once again, we go ahead and we draw our lines, which are going to go from the start position to the final position. And the slopes, remember, represent velocity. Now, runner B has a greater slope than does runner A. And that once again is showing us that runner B had a greater velocity than did runner A for this period of time. Now notice throughout that I have used velocity and I haven't really talked about speed. Speed is just going to be the magnitude of that velocity vector. Think about if you're driving in your car and you're driving on the 405. If you're going 60 miles an hour north or if you're going 60 miles an hour south, the speedometer or the speed meter of your car is just reading 60 miles per hour. It's not reading 60 miles an hour north or 60 miles an hour south. It's just reading 60 miles per hour because that ends up being the speed. Mostly in biomechanics, we're going to be interested in velocities, but I do want you to recognize the differences between velocity and speed. Okay, and once again, the speedometer of your car is telling you how fast you're going without any reference to a particular direction. But let's say I want to hop in my car and I want to drive over to grandma's house. And let's say that grandma lives 60 miles away. And let's say it takes me an hour to get to grandma's house. Does that mean that I was going 60 miles per hour the entire time? I think everybody can appreciate there that the answer is going to be no. Right? I hop in my car and if I'm going to get on that 405, you know I'm not going to be going 60 miles per hour. So what happens? I hop in my car and initially my velocity is going to be zero. Then maybe I get up to 80 miles per hour. Ooh, but then I see California Highway Patrol and I drop down to 50 miles per hour. Then maybe I jump back up to 80 miles per hour again. But oh wait, I get on the 405 and now I'm down to 10 miles per hour. And I get to the Sepulveda Pass, and now I'm going five miles per hour, and I stop. And maybe once I get off the 405 and transition to a different freeway, I can get back up to a higher speed, and then eventually end up back at Grandma's house where I come back to zero. So the point here is, is that rarely is a velocity going to be constant the entire time, but that velocity is going to be changing throughout time. And that leads us to talking about the difference between what is known as an average velocity versus an instantaneous velocity. So here we have another position time curve. Only now, instead of a straight line, you'll notice that it's actually bent. And I said that if we draw a straight line from our origin to our final position, that, was going to, that slope was going to represent velocity. But what velocity that represents ends up being the average velocity. So again, if I'm going to go to grandma's house, she's 60 miles away, it takes me an hour to get there, my average velocity was 60 miles per hour. But I wasn't going 60 miles per hour the entire time. If I want to know what my velocity was at any particular instant in time, that ends up being my instantaneous velocity. And to determine that instantaneous velocity, I have to draw a straight line that just kisses the curve at one particular point. And where it kisses the curve at that one particular point ends up being my instantaneous velocity. So you see, average velocity and instantaneous velocities are going to be different if our velocity is changing. And again, usually our velocity is changing. So now the final concept we have to talk about is what is referred to as a relative velocity. So far, when we've been talking about velocity, it's been implied that we're talking about velocity relative to Earth. We're going 60 miles per hour. We're going 60 miles an hour relative to stationary ground. And sometimes it's important to know that. But if we want to avoid an accident such as this one, we have to know not only about the velocity of the car relative to Earth, but the velocity of a car relative to another car. 
Similarly, when we're talking about who wins a race, we're really concerned about how fast one runner is running relative to another runner. So here, we see the velocity of body B, because remember, the following subscript represents the body, relative to A. So now we're talking about in the frame of reference of runner A in this particular case, or body A, is equal to the velocity of B minus the velocity of A. So once again, the velocity of B relative to A is equal to the velocity of B minus the velocity of A. And implicit in this is both the velocity of B and the velocity of A on the right-hand side of the equation are in that same frame of reference, which in this case happens to be Earth. So let's look at this from a case of vectors. If A and B are running at the same speed or have the same velocity, then the velocity of A relative to B is going to be zero. Think about two cars on the freeway that are both going 60 miles per hour. The relative position between those two cars is not going to change. Now let's say that B is going faster than A. B is going faster than A. We have a velocity that's pointing to the right, and we see that B is going faster than A. So there is a positive velocity of B relative or res with respect to A. And of course, we could also have another situation where the velocity of A is greater than the velocity of B. In this particular case here, you see that that arrow is going to now be pointing backwards, which in this case is negative, and that's something I'll talk more about a little bit later. But in this case here, if we have a negative relative velocity, that means that A is going faster than B. So again, let's return back to the car example. If both cars are going 60 miles an hour, then that means the relative position of A and B are not going to change. It's going to remain constant. Let's say that B is ahead of A, and B is going, say, 60 miles an hour, and A is going 40 miles an hour. Well, it's going to look like B is moving away from A, as they continue on down the freeway. But if those were going to end up being reversed, and let's say A is going 60 miles an hour and B is going 40 miles an hour, now it's going to look like A is catching up to B, or B is going slower relative to A. And again, a lot of times we need to understand both the absolute velocity relative to Earth, as well as the relative velocity to another body. And so let's take a look at a couple of runners here. And again, we're talking about runner B relative to A. And first we see that runner B has a negative velocity. That means that runner A is going faster than runner B. But then somewhere about halfway during the race, B ends up having a positive relative velocity to A. What's happening here? In this case, B is now going faster than A. But don't make the mistake of thinking just because B is going faster than A at the end of the race that B actually won the race. That's going to depend on a lot of different factors that we'll talk a little bit later during this lesson. But it could be that A got so far out in front of B that B never gets caught up to A before the race ends. So I know that was a lot. But those are some ideas relative to velocity, pun intended. Next up, we'll talk about acceleration.